Good afternoon and welcome to Pay Entry's webinar on the second stimulus bill. Now that it's passed, um, let's look at what's included. I'm Kathy Graham. I'll be the presenter today. I am head of the HR services area. Um, Brianna Grimes is my associate and she will be in the background fielding questions. If you have them during the presentation, please put them uh, in the question box and she will be pulling those up at the end and we're going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the session. Um, to, just to let you know a few details, this, record, this is being recorded and will be available on our website by tomorrow afternoon if you'd like to access it there. You also can access a PDF of this in the handout section of your screen. And um, that is an overview of, or it is a copy of the presentation today. But if you um, registered for this, and if you're here, it means you did, you'll also get a copy of the recording tomorrow uh, when it is complete uh, via email. One of the things that I wanna do before I start is to remind you that I'm not an attorney. And when the, this new information comes out, it's raw and it needs to be chewed up by the IRS and the Department of Labor and everyone else and put on their websites to provide a lot more details than I'm going to be able to give you today. But uh, just know that I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving you advice. But what I am doing is sharing information with you today on what we know right now on the second stimulus bill. And we're going to be dealing with the things that, that are included that impact employers. First of all, this is called the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. It was passed by Congress on December the 21st and signed into law on December the 27th, which was this past Sunday. So this is like right off the press. And so lots of lots of things that we still don't know and still have to iron out. Just like every other bill that passes, um, it has to be um, regurgitated by the IRS and the Department of Labor in order to um, make sense of it so that we can apply it to our real world. Okay, what's in this? Well, first of all, the bill extended several pandemic benefits that impact workplaces today, that impacted workplaces in 2020. So some of these are familiar. It also provides for additional PPP loans for small businesses, impacts the rollover of pre-tax contributions, um, such as FSA um, medical and dependent care accounts, and extended certain tax credits that employers use when hiring. Bottom line, it impacted also the unemployment benefits. And I have a few other things we're going to toss in here, but unemployment benefits don't necessarily impact employers, but the way that they are structured often keeps people from applying for jobs because there's more of a benefit to stay out of work. Um, so we'll go over what added benefits there are and what that may do to your recruiting and retention efforts. First of all, let's look at some of the tax-related changes. We're all familiar with the Families First Coronavirus um, Paid Sick and Family Leave. It's called FFCRA. We've been dealing with that throughout 2020 since March. Um, now the tax credits that were allowed have been extended until March the 31st of 2021. However, the mandate was removed. And that means that if employers don't want to comply with this, they don't have to. But if you want to allow your people to go out on COVID leaves and be able to get a tax credit for the time that they're out so that you're not really paying them, the government is paying them through the, through the um, tax credit, then you can continue to do it, but the mandate's gone. So you don't have to continue allowing the paid sick and family leaves unless you want to as an employer. The limits also did not renew. So usage in 2020 carried forward to determine what available leave is there in the first quarter of um, the year, because this only extends to March the 31st. So for example, 
if an employee in 2020 used five days of the 10 day uh, a benefit, which would be 40 hours, then they have five days in 2021 until March 31st to use the remainder, the remaining five days if you as the employer decide to continue this program. But then again, it is up to you. Another tax related change was that it, uh, this bill revised and expanded the employer retention, I'm sorry, employee retention tax credit, ERTC. This is the one where there's some smoke and mirrors and a little fog right now, but um, the tax credit now will be available through June the 30th of 2021. And certain provisions in the bill only apply for benefits after December the 31st of last year. The act does amend the credit to be 70% instead of 50% of qualified wages, which still stand at $10,000 um, in 2020, it was $10,000 a year. In 2021, it's actually um, two quarters at $10,000 a piece. So it's done by quarter in 2021. So during the first two quarters of 2021, the maximum of $10,000 in qualified wages per quarter may be counted in determining the credit. And that would give you a $14,000 total credit for the first two quarters. If your um, this this um, tax credit is only available, however, if the employer's operations were fully or partially suspended because of um, orders from the government to shut down due to COVID-19, or if there were gross receipts, um, for, if the gross receipts of the employer for the calendar quarter are 80% less than the gross receipts for the same calendar quarter of 2019 then the employer would be eligible for that quarter. So we are looking back and we're looking at retroactive dates, 2020 and, and 2019, in calculating whether or not someone is eligible. A little confusing, but it, something in these bills usually is. This is the piece I think that we're going to need to iron out a little bit with more IRS guidance. For employers that have less than $500 or $500, 500 employees, the tax credit available in 2021 is based on qualified wages paid after December the 31st of last year and before July the 1st of this year, regardless of whether the wages were paid for services performed. For employers with more than 500 employees, the credit's based on qualified wages paid to employees not providing services. That means they are not at work, but you're paying them um, to retain them as employees. If you have 500 or less, they can be at work and you can get that credit. So two different things for two different size employers. Qualified wages are not limited to what the employer paid to employees in the specific prior period. And we're talking about comparing 2020 to 2019. It, could, it would be current wages. Wages um, used to determine this credit may not be counted as payroll costs. However, if you are getting a PPP loan, you're no longer excluded from getting a PPP loan if you have uh, one of these tax credit, but you can't use, you can't double dip. Wages do include amounts paid to maintain a group health plan. And that has been clarified somewhat um, during this process. Another tax related change is there has been an extension of the deferred payroll taxes. The act does extend the deadline for employees to repay deferred 2020 Social Security taxes until December the 31st of 2021. So if you were participating in that program, you do have until the end of the year to collect those, uh, uh, those taxes that were deferred. As I mentioned earlier, one of the tax related changes is that um, FSAs, the flexible spending accounts have been impacted. 
Um, the new bill allows a rollover of funds from 2020 to 2021 and from 2021 to 2022 of unused funds without any limits. So regardless of the balance that someone had at the end of 2020, if that's the end of your plan year, they would be able to roll that over. I would assume a plan amendment um, to your um, documents would be required. So if you have a summary plan description and a plan document for your uh, plans, you would need to have those revised to allow that. And it does allow employees to change contributions mid-year in 2021. And just as a reminder, um, talk to your um, provider, your third-party administrator for your flexible spending accounts, um, requesting a plan amendment for these types of changes. Because if it's not in your plan document, you can't do it. And I think a key word here is allows. It doesn't mandate, but it does allow you to do that as the employer. Another curious thing that came across is that there is now a 100% deduction for business expenses for um, going out to eat at a restaurant um, paid or incurred between January the 1st and December the 31st of this year. So all of your employees can go out to lunch with other people and you can deduct that from your taxes. Um, only this is not mandatory. Remember, this is something you can implement, but you will uh, receive a 100% deduction for that business expense. And I believe that is to encourage um, dining out. The tax credit extensions um, have been extended through 2025, and, and that includes three different um, tax credits. One is the Empowerment Zone Employment Credit. One is the employer credit that you receive for paid family and medical leave. And um, then the Work Opportunity Tax Credits. These are all things that you normally, um, or but two of them come at, at uh, employment when you hire someone, and the other one is during employment and maybe state-specific. Okay, um, and this bill also clarified the tax treatment of forgiveness of PPP loans. The act permits employers to deduct expenses paid with forgiven loan proceeds, and this does reverse the IRS's previous position. So I'm sure we'll see some more um, fine print on this one. And then student loans. Um, the act does allow employers um, to pay tax-free principal and interest on qualified um, student loans, educational loans by employers through 1230 of 2025. So it's been kicked way out there, just like the um, prior tax credits we were talking about. So nobody has to think about this for a few years. The Title III of this act was called the Economic Aid to Hard-Hit Small Businesses, Nonprofits, and Venues Act. It does expand loan uses um, eligible for forgiveness. So we're talking about the PPP loans um, included in um, expenses are covered operations expenditures that include software, um, computing in the cloud, human resources, and accounting needs. Um, it includes covered property damage costs that were not covered by insurance, created by public disturbances, covered supplier costs, and those are that would be contracts for goods that were in effect prior to the loan um, covered period that are essential to the business operation. And then we're talking about covered worker protection expenditures, which would be PPP and any other equipment like air filters and circulators and things that, ne uh, uh, that are necessary to comply with federal guidelines for health and safety. And here we have revisions to the Paycheck Protection Program, one of my favorite subjects. I'm just kidding. 
Um, one of the things that there's so many questions in the PPP program, that's why I said I'm kidding because um, it's very hard to, to answer questions from clients because sometimes it just depends on the lender, et cetera. And so it's one of the more frustrating pieces to, to be a resource for. But the, the covered period is now changed. It's 24 weeks. Um, it was, it's still eight weeks for those who received loans prior to June the 5th of 2020. So it doesn't cover that that's already happened. Title three, which is this new um, section of the, of the bill, allows borrowers to select any coverage period that they want um, between eight and 24 weeks after the loan is originated. So it gives the borrower some flexibility. There's also a simplified application for forgiveness. Loans up to $150,000 will be forgiven in full if the borrower signs and submits a, a one-page certification, cannot be more than one page, that's amazing, providing some minimal information, and then they agree to retain their records for four years for employment and three years for all other, which employers do anyway. So this is a piece of cake. Loans over $150,000 are still subject to the Small Business Administration's current procedures. So nothing has changed there. And loans over $2 million are not impacted. And back on the prior screen, no, there is not a template or a format for that one page document yet. I'm assuming there will be, but it's still um, yet to be determined. Um, the EIDL advances uh, will no longer reduce the amount of PPP loan forgiveness. So that's probably a big deal for some. And group insurance payments clarified, um, Title III clarified the fact that group insurance benefits um, do, does include things like life insurance, dental insurance, vision and disability, things that an employer pays for for the employee. So those would be added in um, and are considered payroll costs. I think one of the questions that we had early on about um, this, the PPPP is whether or not um, payroll costs were included. Now under the rev rev revisions, it would be because it's an accounting cost. And uh, businesses can now get a second PPP loan. Um, these are referred to as second draws. And to qualify, the borrower must um, have no more than 300 employees and demonstrate a minimum of 25% reduction in their gross receipts in any quarter of 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019. So where there is a second draw available for small businesses. And I think this was definitely uh, needed by a lot of the small businesses out there. And 300 employees is a lot of employees. That's really, to me, that's a big business, but um, this law says 300. Although as before, special rules do apply to hotels and restaurants. So if you are a hotel or a restaurant and you need more details about that, um, I will find something for you. Just shoot me an email. Regarding loan forgiveness for the PPP loans, um, borrowers are eligible for loan forgiveness equal to the payroll costs and then all of these added together. Payroll cost, the covered mortgage and rent, utility payments, covered operations expenses we just discussed, covered property damage costs we just presented, covered supplier costs which weren't outlined before, and then covered worker protection expenses. The same requirement uh, of 60-40 minimum on payroll costs continues to apply. So 60% of the funds must be used on payroll costs. And that would be all of the above.
And the impact on unemployment insurance, you may have already heard this, but the um, they have extended until March the 31st, both the PUA and the PEUC. Um, and so those are um, unemployment benefits uh, at the federal level that benefit um, employees out of work. It does provide an additional $300 a week in unemployment benefits for the next 11 weeks, so it is limited. Uh, this is the piece, I believe it was 600 last time this rolled out, which really um, damages an employer's ability to hire and retain people because it, you get more money on unemployment than you would working the job. So this is a, for a short time, it is for 11 weeks, and it, it is reduced to $300 a week, which is still um, you know, substantial to some the earners, uh, wage earners. It extends the number of weeks that unemployment is uh, available from 39 to 50 weeks, so the majority of the year. And so what should employers be doing right now at this point in time? Well, one of the first things we do is wait and see what else comes out from the IRS on the specifics of each situation, especially the employer um, employee retention tax credit I'm sure there'll be more coming out on that and on the um, PPP loans. So right now, um, consider, first of all, whether or not you're going to participate in the extension of paid leaves. That's a decision that you need to make because you need to communicate that to your employees. Are you going to continue for the first quarter um, paying the leave and getting the tax credit, or are you going to stop that practice? I'm sorry. Then take advantage of any tax credits that are available to your company that, aren't, that you're not currently utilizing. Restart your student loan assistance program and evaluate that second round of PPP loans available and whether or not that would benefit your business. The other thing is stay tuned. We will probably in a couple of weeks be doing another webinar that will dig into some of the details about some pieces of this new bill once we get more information. But as usual, the first week of any new bill is leaves us with a lot of questions. Um, and if you have questions now, we're going to um, ask Brianna to um, share those questions with me. If they are specific to your company, um, we'll, I'll write you an email back. And um, if not, um, I'll answer them if I can, because some things I will not be able to answer today. So uh, Brianna, do we have any questions? All right, Kathy, thank you for all of that information. We do have a couple of questions, um, so we'll see if we can take a stab at them today. So the first question we had was, what do we do with new employers that did not necessarily have a corresponding 2019 quarters for the ERTC? There, are, there is some guidance on that in the original language. Um, I'll get your email and I will respond to you with that original language. Um, I'm not sure what it was right at this point. Perfect. All right. Uh, next question was, with the expanded HSA legislation, does that override the cap for 2021 of $3,600 for contributions for a single person? The HSA is not impacted in any of this, just the FSAs flexible spending account. HSAs always roll over um, from year to year. FSAs, um, it would not at this point when they have done something like this before um, in the prior rules, the maximum that the person can set aside in an FSA would not be impacted by the rollover. But HSAs are not impacted. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, can you explain more as to what the employer retention tax credit is and who qualifies for it? The um, I would I think that we had a webinar on that, and that would probably take more time than some people want to sit through. So if you can get me an email, Brianna, I will respond to that one directly. Okay. Perfect. All right. Can an employer offer one and not the other benefit? So, for example, um, offer the, the CRA sick leave and none of the others, or is it an all or nothing? 
you can do exactly what you want to do. You can pick and choose. Um, and I'll go back to that employer retention tax credit issue. Bottom line, it's a tax credit so that if you have a reduction um, in your income and have to lay people off, that you can still pay them during that time to retain them as employees. That's the gist of the law. And then um, this one, I think I've had this question on the um, COVID or the CRA sick. Yeah, a lot of employers are thinking about continuing the CRA sick, but not the CRA um, leave. And you can do that. Nothing is mandated, so you can pretty much pick and choose what you want to do. Okay. Just be clear when you communicate it to your employees so that they don't get confused. Do you know when we will be able to apply for the PPP loans? Starting now. Um, as far as I know, I mean, the, uh, the banks probably aren't set up yet because it is just the first week after the release of the bill. So I would contact your lender and ask them when they will be ready. Okay. Is the EERC backdated to the beginning of the CARES Act? ERTC. Um, it is, this is the language that they have in this bill is not retroactive that we know. It is forward. Um, it's prospective, not uh, retroactive. So no, it starts January the 1st of 2021. It does use information from 2019 and 2020 to calculate eligibility, but the tax credits are, are, are current uh, first and second quarter of this year. Okay. Are part-time um, employees eligible for the 80 hours of FFCRA also? It would. They are, but it would be prorated and now not mandated. So uh, in the past, part-time employees would get whatever their regular earnings uh, would have been in a week or a day, uh, um, basically a week. Um, it was 80 hours for full-time, prorated for part-time. Okay, and those out those 80 hours do not reset because it's 2021. It will just be whatever's carried over. So if they use those 80 yep. hours last year, then they don't have any for this year, regardless of whether you offer FFCRA or not, correct? Correct, that's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just an extension or a rollover of the program. Okay, and with regards to the FFCRA, is the tax credit for the full amount paid to the employee? It is up to $511 a day, 100% of pay. Is the forgiveness application for 2020 already available? If yes, where can we find it? It is not available and probably will not be available for two, maybe four weeks. It takes a while for the IRS to um, come up with something like that. The Small Business Administration um, and the banks have to all coordinate that. So, no, it's not available right now. Okay. Um, are there different benefits for nonprofit schools uh, that they may apply for for in this new package? No, everything is for everyone. Um, and another question, can you do the leave by employee and not the plan? I'm assuming they're talking about offering the FFCRA or the child leave by employee yeah. and not by the plan. Yeah, you can do it by plan if you want to. Um, just make sure that employees are clear on that. Yeah, I, I think what she's asking is doing it by the employee, and I would not recommend picking and no. choosing what mm -hmm. employees you allow. It needs to be an all or nothing. So if you're yes. going to offer FFCRA, it's got to mm -hmm. be to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it you run into the potential for discrimination. Right. It can't be a class of people or a group of people. It can't be management versus hourly. It can't be that. It has to be everyone or no one at all because of the discrimination issues. Yeah, definitely. Um, if an employer pays employees in April for work done in March of 2021, would they still be able to take the credits? I think that that would depend on other issues. And if you'll get me the email, I can talk to that person. Okay. That's, I don't think that's been defined yet.
And for the retention credit, I heard that companies can go back to 2020 to get these if they had a PPP loan and did not use these credits in 2020 due to the limitations in place at the time. Does this sound right? Well, since the tax year is closed, I don't think that you can go back now retroactively to get those tax credits. I think that you would have to use it going forward, but I am not a tax expert, so if you should contact your CPA or your tax advisor to find out. And I don't think that the IRS has been clear yet on that. That's probably still to be determined. Perfect. Uh, we had one more pop up. Uh, is there any real guidelines about a new employee and when they would start getting paid for the CARES Act? What if they got paid from a past employer? Does that affect what I pay them? It does not affect what you pay them. So if you have a new employee that started in January and you're going to continue the FFCRA uh, leave, paid leaves, um, that person starts over again with you. So there's nobody um, up above that's watching all, over all of this um, as a, it, it's done by company. Okay, that was it for the questions, Kathy. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for attending today. Um, we look forward to answering more of your questions in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, if there's something that you didn't hear today that you need help with, please let us know. Um, we do have a webinar tomorrow on whether or not you can require your employees to be vaccinated so with the new COVID vaccine. So um, if you haven't registered yet, please do so. Um, thanks for attending. Have a great day.